All right, students, welcome to the final conceptual lecture video covering acid-base equilibrium. In this video, I'm going to teach you guys about polyprotic acids, weak bases, Kb, metal hydroxides, and acid strength. Yeehaw! With that said, let's get started. So believe it or not, many acids, or some acids at least, have more than one acidic hydrogen in them. These are called polyprotic acids. For example, sulfurous acid, H2SO3, does the following. It has, of course, two acidic hydrogens here. So one of them can dissociate to form H+, leaving you with HSO3, or hydrogen sulfite. This first equation has its own weak acid, Ka, the one shown here. What can happen with this hydrogen sulfite? Well, it also contains an acidic hydrogen. So it can dissociate further to get a second source of H+, and then sulfite 2 minus. This weak acid dissociation also has its own Ka, which we call Ka2. You'll notice, of course, that Ka1 is much larger than Ka2, which indicates that the first proton in this example is more acidic than the second. This is the principle of polyprotic acids. Got it? I hope so, because now I'm going to move to a different subject, weak bases. Many substances act as weak bases, or Bs, by removing proton from water to form hydroxide, like this. I've got a weak base, which strips a hydrogen off of water to form HB, its conjugate acid, and release hydroxide. This type of interaction is the interaction of a weak base because I've got an equilibrium arrow, a back and forth in this scenario. So for weak bases, their equilibrium constants, which are called KBs, are this. Now, for your reference, here are some common weak bases with their accompanying KBs. You'll notice, of course, that all of these KBs are less than 1, indicating that they are weak bases, much like I taught you about weak acid Ka values in our previous lecture video. So how do Ka and KB interrelate? Well, as we discussed in an earlier lecture, Kw, which is the dissociation constant of water, which is constantly doing this in an equilibrium setting in real life, happens to be equal to the concentration of hydroxide multiplied by the concentration of hydronium. And numerically, it equals 1 times 10 to the negative 14th, at least at 25 degrees C, which is roughly a room temperature. Interestingly enough, Ka times Kb always equals Kw. So that's an important equation that you should remember or take note of for a problem I'll show you later on. Also, just as pH, whose equation is given here, helps us know how acidic a solution is, there exists something called pOH, which of course I've discussed in an earlier video as well, which helps us to determine how basic a solution is. pOH is given by negative log of the concentration of hydroxide. And just so you know, at 25 degrees Celsius, pOH plus pH equals pKW, which is 14. I've also taught you this earlier, but it's a useful mathematical equation to have in your minds for solving cool problems. Speaking of which, here is one. The pH of a 0.25 molar aqueous solution of hydrofluoric acid, HF, at 25 degrees Celsius is 2.03. What's the value of the Ka for HF? I invite you to attempt this on your own, and then if you wish, you can click on the link here, which will open a separate video in which I'll show you how to do this on the board. And now to another problem. Using the data in this table, which of the conjugate acids below is the strongest acid? Now, I'm not going to answer this for you, but I'll put a link here to a separate video in which I discuss this topic. I invite you to go and look at that and then come back and see if you can answer this question on your own. We now move on to discussing metal hydroxides. Now, incidentally, metals, which I'm abbreviating here as the letter M, often undergo redox reactions with water to form metal hydroxides like this. Now, just so you know, we did first talk about this back in Chapter 4 last semester, to which I'll link right here in case you want to review. Now, as it turns out, the less electronegative a metal, the more reactive it is with this kind of reaction. The reason is because less electronegative metals give up their electrons more easily. Remember, if you're more electronegative, you want to steal electrons. If you're less electronegative, you want to get rid of them. Hence, the further down and to the left on the periodic table, the more reactive a metal will be in this type of reaction. That takes us to a question. Which element least readily reacts with water at room temperature to form a metal hydroxide and hydrogen gas? Now to another subject, determining acid strength. As I mentioned in an earlier lecture, the stronger an acid, the weaker its conjugate base. Why? Well, the reason is because the stronger the acid, the more stable its conjugate base. 
Two factors, then, influence how strong an acid is. First, the electronegativity of the atom stuck to the H+, and second, the size of the atom stuck to the H+. Why? Well, the answer is because the more electronegative an atom is, the more easily it can handle bearing a negative charge by itself. Hence, for any acid-base reaction, such as this one, the more stable A- is, the more acidic HA is. In other words, the more stable this A- is, the more easy it's going to be for HA to lose a hydrogen and turn into A-. Does that make sense? I hope so. Therefore, the more stable A- is, the more acidic HA is. A- is made more stable if, one, it's more electronegative, and or two, it's big. Remember then, the more electronegative an element, the better or more easily it can handle a minus charge. Furthermore, the larger an element, the better it can handle a negative charge. Hopefully we're kind of wrapping our heads around that then, because it brings us to this important series where we can see the relative acidities of different substances. To keep this simple, I want you to focus on row two. What we're trying to do is determine how acidic is something as I go from left to right on the periodic table. First, we have silicon attached to hydrogens. Are those hydrogens acidic? Well, it tells us that this compound is neither an acid or a base. So the answer is no. What if we go one more to the right to phosphorus? Phosphorus is more electronegative than silicon. Are the hydrogens stuck to phosphorus very acidic? Well, no, they're not. That tells us then that phosphorus's lone pair electrons are more likely to grab a hydrogen from something else, thereby making phosphorus a base, then these hydrogens are to be removed, which would make phosphorus an acid. Now, as we go to the right one more, we have sulfur. Sulfur is more electronegative than phosphorus, which means that it can suck electrons towards itself and handle the charge better than phosphorus. What do we notice about sulfur? Well, sulfur, bound to two hydrogens at least, is a weak acid. Now, what happens as we go one more to the right? Chlorine is more electronegative than sulfur, which means it can hold electrons to itself and be even more stable than sulfur can. What happens when I have a hydrogen stuck to chlorine? Well, yeah, that is a strong acid. Thus, you see that as you move from left to right across a row on the periodic table, electronegativity increases, which means that the acidity of a hydrogen stuck to that element increases because the element is more able to bear a negative charge that it would have to have as it let go of that hydrogen. Now, what happens as we go down a column on the periodic table? Well, HF is a weak acid. As I go down, HCl is a strong acid. Now, what about HBr? HBr, as it turns out, is an even stronger acid. So going down a column on the periodic table, acidity increases. Why is that? It's certainly not because of electronegativity, because fluorine is more electronegative than chlorine, which is more electronegative than bromine. So it's got to be something else. What is it? It's size. So why does size affect acidity? Well, I'm going to post a link here to a separate video in which I will explain it for you on the board. For you, my students, I am imploring you to click it and watch it. That takes us to a problem. Based on the principles I just outlined, which of the following is the strongest acid? That takes us to the end of this lecture and to the end of chapter 16. I hope you've had an enjoyable time. Please stay tuned to my upcoming lecture videos in which I'll begin by covering chapter 17's coverage of coveringly coveraged coverage. Until then, have an enjoyable rest of your day.